For the past few weeks, we've been talking about dealing with sinners and cynics. Uh, we, uh, we didn't talk about it last Saturday because last Saturday was our Mother's Day service. And my wife, I thought, did a wonderful job uh, last Saturday. So yeah, give, give her a, a big hand. You need to understand something about my wife because you all haven't lo known her as long as I have. When we first met, going on 30 years ago, 28, 20, 28 years ago, she, wa she was never going to be a person that would ever stand in a pulpit and deliver a message. She, she was the girl who sat on the back row all the time. Am, am, I, am I telling the truth? She was, a, I mean, she was a beautiful, godly woman, but she was not the type of person that ever wanted the spotlight. And she, I mean, she told me when we were dating, she says, oh, I could never marry a minister, <laughs> let alone marry a pastor, you know, let alone be the first lady of a church. She said she could never marry a minister. And I remember telling her at that time I was, uh, I was looking to become a praise and worship leader. I, I didn't know that I was going to eventually become a pastor, but I was a praise and worship leader for 25 years before I started this church. But uh, I told her when we were dating, I said, <laughs> you better get used to the idea of being married to a minister because I'm going to be a minister. And so uh, she finally got used to the idea. And, uh, <laughs> but I, I, I cannot tell you how proud I am of you. I mean, and the, the, just the way, and the, the, the way that you presented the word and then the revelation that she presented. Uh, you know, when, when she was talking last week about how greater is better than a double portion, because double has limits on it. Double is double, and that's just double. But greater is greater. It greater than double, it's greater than triple, it's greater. Amen. So, that was a good word. But we've been talking about dealing with sinners and cynics. Tonight I want to get into part three, and this is probably going to conclude this series, I think. Uh, unless God drops something else in my spirit along this same line. But we live in a world that's becoming more and more godless, folks. We, we are seeing a generation, now probably even two or three generations in a row, that the majority of people in this generation are ignorant of spiritual things. We've got a society that is in need of Christ, and we've got a growing number of people in our society that think Christianity is the enemy. They think you and I are the enemy. You and I are immoral. Satan is doing all that he can to paint the wrong picture of God and the wrong picture of his character. To the point now that we have an entire generation of people who, number one, either think God doesn't exist, or number two, if he does exist, he's some sort of immoral, maniacal monster. And that's not who God is. God is not a monster. God is not a maniac. God is not immoral. God is love. That's what the Bible says. The problem is, if you read the Bible from the point of view of a skeptic or a cynic, then you're going to have the tendency to twist the word of God into painting a picture of a maniacal God, a crazy God. You can take anything out of context. Sinners and cynics... We talked about this the last couple of weeks. They always want to focus on the few verses of Scripture that they don't understand. And they twist those verses into meaning something that they don't. And while they do that, they completely ignore all of the verses that talk about God's love, His forgiveness, His compassion, His healing, the blessing of God, salvation of God, all the good news of the Bible. They skip all of that. And they focus on the weird, obscure verses. And we covered some of those uh, the last couple of weeks. And all of this is an attempt to remove God from the equation of life. Because if God doesn't exist, then we don't have anyone to be accountable to for our life choices. We can do whatever we want if there is no God to answer to. And if God does exist, but God is immoral then we also have no obligation to follow him because he's cracked. He doesn't deserve our worship. He doesn't deserve our service because he's immoral. But God is not immoral. Isaiah said in uh, chapter 5, verse 20, he says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. 
to those who put darkness for light and light for darkness, those who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Now, you and I know that God is good, right? Yes. And this says, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. And we know God is good. So we could say, woe to those who call evil God and God evil. Because a lot of people in, in our society today, they believe that God is evil, if he exists at all. Christians need to know how to answer some of the misunderstandings and fallacies that society has about God. We need to know how to answer these things. And that's why we've been talking about this for the last couple of weeks. You know, I was talking with my wife the other day about these obscure laws that you find in the Old Testament, these types and shadows that we were talking about two weeks ago, two, two Saturdays ago and three Saturdays ago. And we were looking at some of the laws that the Israelites had in the Old Testament, these, these really obscure, strange laws that if, if you look at the Bible from a 21st century Western civilization kind of outlook, the Bible's going to look weird to you, okay? These are the laws that unbelievers and skeptics, they always want to spend all of their time talking about them because they're, they're weird, obscure laws that don't make sense on the surface. So never mind all the times that God encourages us and God tells us not to fear and God gives us hope for the future. God tells us to love one another. No, God must be crazy because he told the Israelites not to wear two types of uh, thread in the same garment. That kind of stuff. Christianity's crazy because God told the Israelites that they shouldn't plant two different uh, crops in the same field. So because of that, you... you Everyone associated with God is crazy. Well, no, there was a reason for all of these laws. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. But my, my, my wife, she, she pointed out that, look at it from a parenting point of view. When you have all of these types and shadows in the Old Testament, it becomes a teaching tool to explain these things to kids. Paul said that all of these laws that we had in the Old Testament, they were shadows of things to come, but the reality is in Christ, right? These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. These laws, they were foreshadows of what God was going to do in the new covenant, but the focus is not on the laws. The focus is on the thing that they're pointing to. They're pointing to Christ. Christ is the reality. Everybody tracking with me? Okay. So when these things, these weird laws that they had in the Old Testament, when they are a part of your normal lifestyle, it becomes a teaching tool that you can use to explain to kids. You can say, hey, Sally, God doesn't want us to contaminate our lives just like fields shouldn't be contaminated with two different crops. It becomes a teaching tool. Hey, Billy, you know, God doesn't want us to prey on other people, just like the fact that we don't eat animals that are predators. Remember, Israel could only eat animals that chewed cud. They, they, they were not allowed to eat carnivorous animals. Hey, Susie, God wants us to rest in our salvation and not try to earn our salvation through works, just like we rest on the Sabbath day. You see how these things become a foreshadow of what God wanted to accomplish in the, new, in the new covenant. They were a foreshadow, but Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. That's what the word of God says. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So Jesus wasn't abolishing the law. He wasn't abolishing the prophets, but he is the fulfillment of what they represented. Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. So when all of these things are part of your everyday lifestyle, it becomes much easier to use them as teaching tools. Now, it becomes easy to criticize Old Testament law when, number one, you haven't been brought up in Jewish culture, so the customs are foreign to you. And it also becomes easy to criticize when you look at the Bible from a cynical perspective. No, there's a, there's a difference between looking at something from a critical perspective and looking at something from a cynical perspective. 
God wants you to ask questions. God does not want you to be ignorant of the way that he does things and why he does things. There's nothing wrong with asking questions. There is something wrong with viewing everything in the word of God from the lens of cynicism. Most believers are, most unbelievers are not critical, they're cynical. And because of that, they're closed-minded. So when you look at the Bible through cynicism, all of the Old Testament things just seem weird and unnecessary. Well, they're not weird. And they're not unnecessary. But they require more than six minutes of study in order to understand them. Amen? You can't make a theological conclusion based on a post that you read on social media. You've got to study this thing. You've got to find out. This is, a, this is an important document. You've you got to dig into this thing if you want to understand it. To those who were raised in Jewish culture, Old Testament law, a lot of those things make a lot more sense because they were raised in it. To those who take the time to learn the word of God, they make more sense. Now I want to show you something that I recently discovered regarding the way people view God. And <laughs> I was really surprised when I found this out. How many are familiar with Google? Google is the number one search engine on the internet. Now, I've been around computers long enough. I mean, I was designing websites back in the 90s. And I remember when Google was not the number one search engine on the internet. I remember searching using Bing and using Yahoo and using, how many remember Alta Vista? <laughs> like two of us. <laughs> but Google is the number one search engine on the internet. Google holds 70% market share for all internet search engines. 70%. That means if you take every other search engine in the planet and put them all together, Google's twice as big as all of them put together. So, here on Google are the top three searches that people post in Google relating to God. So, in other words, when people make a search concerning God in Google, here are the top three things that they ask. Number one, who created God? Number two, why does God allow suffering? And number three, why does God hate me? Those are the three most popular questions on Google regarding God. Now, all three of those questions are valid questions. But they also point to how ignorant most people are concerning God. Because that first question again, who created God? That's the number one question that people ask regarding God. And that question just shows you how uninformed most people are. Because if you knew anything about God, all you got to do is read the very first verse of the Bible. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In other words, it's established from the very first verse of the Bible that God is the creator. Nobody created him. God is the creator. Everything that was created was created by God. So God lives outside of the boundaries of the things that he created. God created time, space, and matter. So God is not bound by the limits of time, space, and matter. There was nothing before God because God doesn't, God is not bound by time. God created time. So there was nothing before him. There was nothing to create him. He has always been. I know it's hard for us to wrap our mind about, around that. But God is the creator. Nobody created him. The second question, why does God allow suffering? Now, that's usually a question that's asked by a person who's going through suffering. In other words, when a, pa when a person is facing a disappointment, they're facing a failure, they're facing uh, a problem in their life, they're facing suffering in their life, God is usually the first one that they blame. Why did God allow me to go through suffering? And again, this becomes another reason that people think God is immoral. Because they think that a moral God would not allow suffering. Well, guess what? When you shut God out of your life, 
What obligates God to shield you from the pain and the suffering of living in a world that's cursed because of our sin? What obligates God to come to your rescue when you shut him out of your life? You take prayer out of schools. You remove the Ten Commandments from the courthouse. You tell kids that God had nothing to do with creation and that some sort of big bang exploded. Somehow something was created from nothing. And we can't explain it, but this big, huge explosion happened. And uh, billions of years later, some amino acids formed the first protein. And billions of years after that, we crawled out of the ooze. And billions of years after that, we evolved from monkeys even though there's no missing links between monkeys and, and humans, unless you count socialists. <laughs> Just kidding. But you take God out of everything, you flood the airwaves with this rhetoric, you tell people that God doesn't exist, and then when something bad happens in your life, you want to blame God. You want to blame the very one that you said didn't exist. But well, you got to make up your mind. Either he exists or he doesn't. And if he does exist, stop shutting him out of your life. Amen. And if he doesn't exist, then stop blaming him for the way you messed up your life. Amen. For those who always want to blame God for the hardship that they go through in life, remember this. The Bible says the way of the transgressor is hard. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 15. Good judgment wins favor. If you exercise good judgment, you're going to have favor in your life. But the way of the transgressor is hard. Life's going to be tough when you shut God out of your life. Life's going to be tough when you don't line up your life with God's plan for your life. The way of the transgressor is hard. But what did Jesus say? My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Life isn't supposed to be hard. Amen. And then the third question that really struck me. Why does God hate me? Satan would love for you to think that God hates you. But you see, God doesn't just love you and God doesn't just have love. The Bible says that God is love. He, does, he who does not love does not know God, for God is love. God is the manifestation of pure love. But if Satan can get you to question that, if he can bring suspect on God's character... That's going to make you want to shut God out of your life. The truth of the matter is this. Many people in our society today, they hate themselves. They have poor self-esteem. They don't like who they see when they look in the mirror. And so they assume that God hates them as much as they hate themselves. They filter their picture of God through their picture of themselves. God doesn't hate you. God loves you. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. God loves you. He is love. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Well, here's my question. How are people ever going to come to the throne of grace, let alone come boldly to the throne of grace, if they believe that God hates them? Satan is always trying to distort the character of God in the eyes of people. And unfortunately, we have an entire generation of people who are uninformed, they're ignorant, and they've bought the lie. God doesn't hate you. Let me show you something powerful. I, I just came across this a couple of weeks ago. This is really powerful. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 12. Solomon says this, The king's wrath is like the roaring of a lion. Everyone say roaring of a lion. Roaring of a lion. <laughs> the king's wrath is like the roaring of a lion, but his favor is like dew on the grass. The king's wrath is like the roaring of a lion. Now, this phrase, roaring of the lion, does that remind anybody of another verse in the Bible? Yep, somebody's saying it. He walks around as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. 
So Satan walks around like a roaring lion, and Proverbs says that the wrath of a king is like a roaring lion. So you know what Satan is doing? He is walking around impersonating an angry king. Satan is walking around trying to paint the picture of a king who's angry with you. And if you can buy the lie that there is a king who is angry with you, then you're going to have a distorted picture of the king that we serve. Again, these three questions, they are the top three questions regarding God on Google. The largest search engine in the world. The top three. In other words, these questions, they don't represent a few dozen people asking about God. This isn't a few hundred or a few thousand people. This is millions of inquiries. Millions of people out there who do not understand who God is. Well, guess what? It's our job to inform them. Our job is to replace lies with truth. I heard somebody once say, my job is to expose lies. No, it's not. Your job is to expose truth. Amen. Truth overcomes lies. Lies will die out on their own. Proverbs says that a lying tongue, it just lasts for a moment. The, the lie can't self-sustain itself. A lie can't perpetuate itself. Truth can. Yeah. Truth can perpetuate itself. Your job is not to expose lies. Your job is to replace lies with truth. Amen. We are the ambassadors of Christ. We are the representatives of God's kingdom on this planet. Who's going to replace the lie with the truth if it's not you and me? Amen. Now here's another common question that unbelievers and skeptics and sinners and cynics always ask. Well, if God is real, why doesn't he just reveal himself to us? How many have heard people ask that question? How many have asked it yourself? That's, it's a legitimate question. If God is real, why doesn't he just re reveal himself to us? You know, if God revealed himself to me, then I'd serve him. Well, to answer that, let me, let me make something very clear. Even if God did personally reveal himself to you, that does not necessarily mean you'd believe in him. I can show that to you in the Bible. How many remember Thomas? Now, Thomas was not only a follower of Jesus. Jesus had thousands of followers. I mean, when Jesus walked through different towns and cities and countrysides, he had hundreds, he had thousands of people following him. That's why there was always a crowd around him. He was pushing through a crowd when the woman with the issue of blood grabbed the hem of his garment. He had to feed thousands of people with a few loaves and a few fish. He always had thousands of people. But he also had disciples that were closer than those thousands. At one point, he sent out 70, two by two. Sent them out, 70 of his disciples, the, the people that were closest to him. But even closer than that were his 12 disciples. The, those were his, his key circle, his key team. Thomas was one of the 12 disciples. Thomas walked with Jesus. Thomas ministered with Jesus for three years. Thomas witnessed miracles. Thomas saw blind eyes opened. Thomas saw deaf ears opened. Thomas watched Jesus feed 5,000 men with just a few loaves and a few fish, plus thousands of women and children beside that. Thomas saw lepers cleansed. Thomas saw the dead being raised. Thomas was there when Lazarus was raised. Thomas worked with Jesus. Thomas heard Jesus say that Jesus was going to be in the earth for three days. He was there. Thomas saw Jesus beaten. Thomas saw Jesus crucified. And then a few days later, the disciples told Thomas that Jesus was resurrected. And what did Thomas say? John chapter 20, verse 25. The other disciples therefore said to Thomas, we have seen the Lord. So Thomas said to them, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. 
In other words, it doesn't matter what I've already seen, what I've already experienced. I'm not going to believe this until I see it. And so when Jesus showed up, he allowed Thomas to put his finger in his wounds, put his hand in his side. And then what was Jesus' response to Thomas? Verse 29. Then Jesus told him, you believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. Now, why is it important for people to believe without seeing Jesus? Because Jesus was about to ascend into heaven. He wasn't going to be here on earth anymore. And there were thousands of years between when Jesus was going to ascend and when he's coming back. The rest of humanity was never going to have a chance to see him in person, but salvation is still available to all of us. Amen? Amen? So blessed are those who believe even though, they, even though they haven't seen me. Here's something else to consider. Jesus ascended to heaven in front of 500 followers. How many read that in the Bible? When Jesus ascended, there were 500 people that witnessed him ascend into heaven. Now, what did he tell them right before he ascended into heaven? He said, stay here. Stay here in Jerusalem because I'm going to be sending the Holy Spirit and he's going to endue you with power. So don't go anywhere. I'm leaving. I'm going to prepare you a place, but I'm sending another comforter. He's just like me and he's going to empower you. Stay here. Don't go anywhere. Now, the Holy Spirit filled them in the upper room 10 days later. Only a week and a half had passed since they saw him ascend. But in that week and a half, 500 people turned into 120. 380 people left in a week and a half. Over 75% of Jesus' closest followers, they took off just in 10 days. They had seen Jesus, they had witnessed his miracles, they had witnessed his resurrection, they personally witnessed him ascending into heaven. But even after witnessing something so miraculous, they were gone in only a week and a half. So I'm going to say this, if you're an unbeliever, don't be so arrogant as to say that if you saw him, you would believe in him. There were people that saw him and they didn't believe. Thomas saw him and didn't believe. 380 of his followers saw him and they didn't believe. Jesus said, you're really blessed if you haven't seen and you still believe. Amen? Speaking of seeing and not believing, how about this? How about simply observing the awesome creation that points to the existence of a creator? Romans chapter 1, verse 20, Paul says, For ever since the world was created... People have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, so they have no excuse for not knowing God. The Bible says the fool has said in his heart there is no God. And how true that is, because God's creation points to the fact that there's a creator. People don't have an excuse for not believing in God. I mean, how can you look at his creation and say that he doesn't exist? I wrote a meme that I posted on our uh, Facebook page a few months ago. And uh, I was putting these notes together and I thought, I need to pull that meme back up. And I I'm just going to show it to you. But here's what I wrote a few months ago. Anyone who can view the vast expanse of the universe, the intricate systems of the human body, the perfection at which our solar system orbits the sun, the order in which the seasons perpetuate life and the mathematical precision in which it all functions together and still insist that it all happened by accident, that person is a complete and utter fool. I told you a couple of weeks ago about the discussion that I saw online. There was a, an atheist and a believer and the atheist was telling the believer that he believed that there were that there's life on other planets. And the Christian guy, he said, now we've already established, it's been mathematically, scientifically established that the odds of the Big Bang creating the universe and all of the things that had to happen in order to create life here on Earth. You know, our, our planet is at just the right distance from the sun. If we were closer, it'd be too hot. It wouldn't sustain life. 
If we were farther away from the sun, it'd be too cold. It wouldn't sustain life. Our, our, our planet rotates on an axis. It's on a tilt, and that's what creates seasons. And those seasons are what help perpetuate life. The fact that our, our, our gravity is exactly what we need, our oxygen is exactly what we need, all of these things, they said that you have a, a better chance of a 747 spontaneously assembling itself in a junkyard. You have a better chance of that than the chance of the Big Bang creating everything. So, I mean, think about that. A 747, all these parts laying in a junkyard, every single rivet, every nut, every bolt, every screw, every piece of uh, sheet metal, every fuel line, every fan blade on all the engines, uh, all of the instruments, all of the seats and the overhead bins and the glass and everything, this 747 spontaneously assembles itself with no outward help. You have a better chance of that happening than the Big Bang creating intelligent life. <laughs> and so this Christian said, you mean to tell me you believe that something that has worse odds than a 747 spontaneously assembling itself that happened more than once? There's intelligent life elsewhere, and it's all done by chance? I mean, it's crazy enough to believe that it happened once, but if you believe that it happened multiple times on multiple planets, he says, you can believe in that, but you can't believe in the existence of an intelligent creator? He says, you got more faith than I do. <laughs> we have been posting videos uh, on Facebook in order to kind of get our church out there into the to basically market our church I, I don't like to use that word market but to to get our name out there because a lot of people don't really know that we're here yet we've we've only been here for about two years and so I've been posting videos on Facebook and what I'll do is I'll take uh, a clip from a service or maybe a song that we did uh, and make a little music video and uh, I'll post it on Facebook and then with Facebook you can boost a post. You can pay to have Facebook put it in the, in, in the eyes of more people. And so uh, what we'll do is we'll boost a video and over a period of about 10 days, usually somewhere between 10 and 15,000 people will see that video in a 10 day period. And the amazing thing is we've noticed that about 10% of the people who view it click through to our website. So we are getting some traffic from that. And we've also seen some first time guests coming in because they've seen us on Facebook. Well, how many know that when you put yourself out there, you're also gonna get skeptics and critics and that kind of thing too. So there was a guy who saw one of our videos. It was a music video that I had posted from Easter. And the guy said, well, what if I don't believe in your God? Well, first of all, <clears throat> My question is this, if you don't believe in God, then why are you wasting your time trolling a church social media page? I mean, folks, there's lots of things I don't believe in, but I don't go around posting on the pages of Buddhists or Muslims or Hindus or socialists or communists or anarchists. I don't waste my time arguing with people that I don't agree with. Amen? Amen. So if you're taking time out of your busy day to ask questions, what it really means is deep down you do believe, but you're too prideful to simply ask a humble question. And so you'd prefer to be snarky and cynical. Because here's the thing. If you can be snarky and cynical and rude and condescending and bait me into acting as rudely and condescending as you are, then you can say, well, why do I need your God when you're just as rude as I am? Your life is just as messed up as mine is. And see, that becomes their justification for running from God. So don't, don't allow people to bait you into uh, an argument. Amen? That, that's, that's not how you win over sinners and cynics. He said this. He said, if God really exists, then why does he need you to speak for him? And I thought, well, because I am the ambassador of Christ. I represent another government. He says, why can't God just call me himself? And I said, well, he's been calling you all your life. 
He said, you know, we're not living in the Bronze Age anymore. It's time to do away with the fairy tales. He says, the God that you believe in is immoral. And then he said this. He said, if God is so real, have that a-hole give me a call. Except he didn't say a-hole. He said the word. Now, it was that moment that I realized this guy believes in God. Because nobody ever referred to a fictional character as an a-hole. Right? There's a lot of bad fictional characters out there. You know, I'm a Star Wars fan. Darth Vader is a bad guy. He, he hunted down and destroyed the Jedi Knights. He's bad. I'm still sore over it. Okay? Louise and I, we love... Marvel movies, the Marvel superheroes, Thanos, he's a bad guy. He destroyed half of the life in the universe. He's a really, really bad guy. The Wicked Witch of the West. How many ever seen The Wizard of Oz? Play the clip, Kale. And as for you, my fine lady, it's true, I can't attend you here and now as I'd like, but just try to stay out of my way. Just try. I'll get you, my pretty, and your little dog, too. <laughs> She's a bad character. Watch. I'll get you, my, my pretty, and your little dog, too. You're going to rub out the dog over a pair of shoes? Now, these are very, very bad characters, but you know what? I'm 47 years old. I've never heard anybody refer to those characters as an a-hole. Why? Because they don't exist. They're fictional. So the fact that this guy called God an a-hole, that, that proves to me that this professed atheist believes in him. Most people who choose not to believe in God are dealing with some sort of pain or disappointment in their life. They blame God for their pain. They blame God for their disappointment. And so they're running from God. So what I want to tell you tonight is if you want to be effective in dealing with sinners and cynics, you need to get to the root of their disappointment first. Find out the root cause, not the symptom. Don't deal with the symptom. Deal with the root. Why are you disappointed? What, what are, why, why are you running from God? What disappointment did you have in your life? They're looking for answers, folks. That's why they troll you online. Now, they, they may be jerks about it, but most of the time, it's just they're too prideful to admit that they believe in God. So when they ask questions, my encouragement is this. Go ahead and take a minute to answer them. Be polite, be patient, and most importantly, Recognize the fact that the person that you're dealing with is broken. They're hurting. They're in pain. When this guy was trolling us a few weeks ago, I invited him to church. I did. I said, if you have any questions, come to church. I'll sit down and I'll talk with you. And if he shows up, I'll sit down with him and I'll talk with him about these things. Unfortunately, the chances are he won't show up. Why? Because he doesn't want God to exist. Most people don't want God to exist because if God does exist, then they're going to have to change their outlook on life. They're going to, ch they're going to have to change their selfish ambitions, their self-centered ways of looking at life. Now, when you're, when, when, when you're wanting to minister to somebody who's a sinner, a cynic, a skeptic, a lot of people say, well, I don't know what to say. I can't minister to this person because I don't have all the answers. Well, that's one of the reasons that we got into this series is that I want to give you some of the answers. But I'm also going to say this. Just do the best that you can and let the Holy Spirit fill in the gaps. Amen? You might be surprised at how your compassion alone will reach people. Just the fact that you're willing to have a conversation with them. I had a guy who once come, came up to me. He said, you know... Uh, I was ministering to a guy at work, and he was an atheist, and he said, I'm, I'm realizing now that I'm, I'm learning some, some scriptural principles and things. He says, I prayed with this guy, even though he was an atheist, I prayed with him. 
He says, but I'm realizing that some of the things that I prayed were unscriptural. He said, I, I kind of feel bad about that. He says, I, I've got a lot to learn. But he told me, he said, when I got done praying, this guy was in tears. Now, this guy was a professed atheist. And he brought him to tears just because he had the compassion enough to pray for him. He had the compassion enough to have a conversation with him. Again, most people who choose not to believe in God, they're dealing with some sort of pain, some sort of disappointment in their life. So just you reaching out to them with, with a kind word, a kind heart, an encouraging word. And again, don't repay their rudeness with rudeness. Don't repay their condes condescension with condescension. Just be compassionate. And hey, you know what? If you don't know all the answers, don't pretend that you do. None of us know all the answers, but all of us who are believers, we've got the Holy Spirit on the inside of us, and he can fill in the parts that you can't. Amen? So when you're dealing with sinners and cynics, just recognize this. You're dealing with broken people, and you're, you're dealing with people who want answers. Everybody wants answers. Thank God we have the answer. We carry the answer. Greater is he who's in you than he who's in the world. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Hi, I'm Heath. And I'm Louise. And we want to thank you so much for watching this video. Faith Life Worship Center in Naples, Florida is a Bible-believing, spirit-filled, non-denominational church. If you live in Southwest Florida and you're looking for a good church with a fun and energetic contemporary worship experience, awesome children and youth ministries, and a great family atmosphere, we'd love to see you at one of our services really soon. Go to faithlifeworshipcenter.com to learn more about our church, watch other messages online, check out our store, or support our ministry financially. Please take a few seconds to like this video and subscribe to our channel. You can also find us on social media. We hope that you'll watch other messages online, but what we really want is to see you in person at Faith Life Worship Center. Hope to see you soon. Bye. Bye.